All right, Psalm chapter 34. Again, we've been looking at the book of Psalms. Psalms is bro- it's 150 songs, right? And it's broken into five books, essentially, covering an extensive, extensive period of time. Um, David, again, like we talked about a few weeks ago, wrote most of them. And Psalms 1 through 41 are mainly, which is where, which is where I've kind of been camping out, they're mainly reflective over David's experience, okay? David's life experience, David's um, 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 experience with God. It's, it's more his testimony. And so these books, these, these psalms are gathered together as songs of praise, words of encouragement, words of warning. And the psalms have given us plenty of opportunities to praise. I mean, if you look at Psalm 150, Right? It talks about praise Him with the symbols. Praise Him. Just praise God for all that He's done. But the daily challenge for us and the tension that I want to bring up this morning that I believe Psalm 34 addresses is this. The daily challenge for us is will we remember? Will we recall? Will we be able to recite what we've seen and heard? Have you ever been driving on a road trip or maybe just driving home from work and you remember what you were thinking about 10 miles ago, but then there's a gap and you're like, oh no, I'm in the next state, I'm in the driver's seat and I don't remember getting here. Ever been there? Okay, great. I'm glad I'm not the only crazy driver in the room, right? Or have you ever, have you ever um, maybe, maybe you're a parent and, and you have a, a son or daughter and they're reading a book, right? Mom, Dad, I just finished this awesome, awesome book. Well, tell us about it. Um, there was a picture that no right and, and so and so the, the the challenge for us and and how do I put this especially hmm especially as we season in life right especially as we advance in days in life in years right the daily challenge for us the challenge for us is will we remember will we be able to recall what we've seen and what we've heard. And we talk about in base camp, which we're, we're, we're going to do another base camp here soon, um, but we talk about how important journaling is with this, right? Because you're so much more apt to remember something as you write it down, right? As you take notes, as you journal, you're so much more apt to remember things, right? So that's why I know so many of you are sitting in this room, you got your Bible over one knee, you got your notebook over the other knee, you got a pen or a pencil in hand, you're just so ready to take notes, and you're just so excited to be here, right? Or you have your dumb device out and you're ready to take notes, okay? Right? But the point is, the point that I'm making is, David wrote down everything. And even, even in this, right, this psalm was written when David was in hiding, okay? David was in hiding because he was surrounded by King Saul, and he pleads with God to rescue him. He's pleading with God to rescue him, and God did indeed answer and rescued him. And so this psalm is a psalm to express gratitude to God, something that I believe we could all do more of. Everybody take a deep breath. Now, just whisper, thank you, God, for that breath. Wow. Thank you for that breath. Thank you for that breath. Thank you for the calories represented on that bake sale table. Mmm. Mmm. Glory. Right? Thank you. And so David, David is thanking God for rescuing him as he was in hiding. Right? And so Psalm chapter 34, let's read it together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. 
Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Now, let's pause right there. These first three verses, I believe, set an example for how we should approach God. Because I want you to notice, again, David is coming to God in desperate, in desperate uh, need of rescuing. He's crying out to God. So David is approaching God for something, but I want you to notice how he approaches God. It's very important for us this morning. First of all, he approaches him in awe. Look, at, look back at verse 1. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David was worshiping God in verse 1. He was reminding himself of the person and work of God. I will bless God. He is worthy of praise. I will magnify Him. I will worship Him. And so when we approach God, we always talk about how God will meet us at the level of our expectation. When we approach God, whether it be a Sunday morning or a Wednesday afternoon or whenever we approach God, right, we ought to start with reminding ourselves of the awesomeness, the awe of who God is. To magnify Him. To worship Him. Now, people worship God in different ways. Amen? Right? People respond in different ways. Some of you wish, I, I remember being a, a teenager in church and just loving, loving when the music was just a little bit longer and the preaching was a lot a bit shorter. <laughs> right? Some of you resonate with that. I would appreciate if you didn't nod your head so profusely this morning. Okay? Uh, others are different, right? You, you, you'd be great with one or two songs, standing optional, right? Um, and, 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 more, and more of a teaching, a longer, a, longer, a longer message, right? Some of you, some of you would even be okay if we actually instituted or started, and I invite you to start it yourself, be a self-starter, it's okay, people will follow, right? Doing a little clapping, right? During the music. Maybe even a little, right? Stepping back. Oh, don't, don't go too far. Right? Don't go too far. But the point is, people worship in different ways. And all I'm trying to help you see this morning is how David approached God. It was in worship. He needed something. But he didn't start, oh God, I need you. Where are you at? The psalm could have been pretty short, but it's 22 verses long, right? But he approaches God from a place of worship. The second place, he, the second thing he does is he approaches God. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. So not only reminding himself of who God is and the awesomeness and the worship of God, but reminding himself of who he is. He don't, you know, he comes to God in worship, but he comes to God humbly. And he even says, let those, let those come and approach God humbly who desire to hear Him. And so in humility, and we've, we've, we define humility here at Summit Church as an accurate view of ourselves directly related to a high view of God. And so David, in verse 1, high view of God. Verse 2, accurate view of himself. Not a high view of himself, not a too low view of himself, a false humility, but an accurate view of himself directly related to a high view of God. It's humility. It's humility. And so he comes in awe and worship. He comes in humility. And then number three, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So before he asks God of anything, he approaches God in worship, he approaches God in humility, and he approaches God with praise. Magnify his name. Praise his name. Exalt his name with me together this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, he's good. Look at your other neighbor and say, even when it doesn't feel like it. And so what, what, what David's doing here is he's worshiping in humility with praise. Let me tell you, let me, let me just tell you, let me just tell you, we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? And that's, that's the reminder of David here in this psalm. Okay, verse 4. I sought the Lord 
and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. I almost said heard him. The South never leaves you. And this, poor, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, there's the humility again, and delivers them. What what you can take from verses 4 through 7 is simply this, God is constant. He's constant. What he did for David thousands of years ago, he's prepared to do for you this morning. Sought the Lord, he answered me. He answered me. Did he answer me when I wanted him to? Maybe not. But he answered me. Those who, he delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, joyful. Their faces shall never be ashamed. They're confident. Verse 6, this poor man cried. The Lord heard him. There it is again. He heard him. He answered him. He saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him. The Lord will fight the battles. We've talked about that. Verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. For those who fear Him have no lack. Mm, The provision of God. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come. Come. O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You know what we see there in verses 11 through 14 is this. It's what, it's what Paul uh, talks about later in the New Testament. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? David's saying, follow, follow me. Come, listen to me. I'll teach you. I will teach you. Keep your tongue from evil. Turn away from evil. Do good. Seek peace and pursue it. David's saying, follow me as I follow God. Verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and His ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles, out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of His servants. None of those who take refuge in Him will be condemned. Now, some, some of you may be distracting. We're going to unpack this quite a bit because i got two points for you and then a few sub-points and all of that. So, um, you know, with the lack of plans today with the rain, let's just plan on sharing dinner together. Okay? <laughs> Mike says, sweet. I'm in. Um, so, some of you might... Some of you might, especially in today's, today's church culture, get distracted by some of the language there. Right? Some, some, of it, some of it kind of sounds, you know, a little, a little harsh. Right? Um, where he says, uh, um, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. To cut them, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Um, but it speaks to the theme of the entire Old Testament, which goes like this. This is what we see all from Genesis to, to the Italian prophet Malachi. <laughs> you got there. Blessings for obedience, cursings for disobedience. Blessings for obedience, 
cursings for disobedience. Now, and, and before, we get, before we get worked up talking about, talking about, talking about cursings and, and, and things like that, let's, let's, let's think about this. That's true in life, isn't it? I mean, I love, I love the verse here where, where, David, where David says, um, oh, where is it? With the lions. Um, uh, verse 10, the, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing, right? We've all seen the young person that comes out and that knows, absolutely knows, no matter how many times the older person has done it, and, and, and failed and has tried to teach the young lion, but the young lion knows, knows a better way. And so they cut some corners to get that better way because they're going to do it more efficiently. They're going to do it faster and they're going to get more. How many of us have seen that young lion just fall flat on their face or been that young lion that has fallen flat on their face? Amen, I see those hands, right? You're in the right place, Right? We see this. We see this. Blessings for obedience, cursings for disobedience. There is, there is a blessing. There is a blessing for walking in righteousness, in right standing with God. Now, does that mean everything is Twinkies and Ding Dongs? Are Ding Dongs still a thing? Okay. I don't know where that came from. I just didn't really want to say rainbows and unicorns or No, because look later. He even says he even says in verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And so it doesn't mean, when we talk about the theme of the Old Testament, we're looking here at this text, it doesn't mean blessings for obedience and cursings for disobedience, that if you pursue God, if you walk in righteousness, you're never going to struggle. That is not the message I'm selling to you this morning. Because it's not biblical. Jesus even says, if they hate me, they're going to hate you even more. Sign me up. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you've got to see the but. The Lord, what? Delivers them all. But the Lord delivers them out of them all. So, all of that's free. Okay? Let's talk about it. Let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, we see in the first half of this psalm, very simply this. David is acknowledging and testifying about God. We talked about this a few weeks ago, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just show you how and where he's doing this, and, and, and we're going to move forward, and we're going to talk about what do we do with it, okay? All right, so David's acknowledging and testifying about God because he was in the pit, he was in hiding, and God brought him out. He redeemed him, okay? He saved him. How does he do this? First of all, David says, David's reminding that he's continuous. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. God is continuous. Since he is everlasting, since God is everlasting, we have a never-ending opportunity to praise him. Just like the deep breath, just like the calories on the bake sale table, right? We have a never-ending opportunity to praise God. Are you here with family this morning? Are you, are you, you know, did you get a parking spot today? Are you on this, right? Like, like a never-ending opportunity to praise God. And David's reminding himself in the awe of God, in the worship of God, that he has a never-ending opportunity to praise God. Some of you need to remember that this morning. That in the midst of the criticisms, in the midst of the afflictions, in the midst of the things that you're struggling with, you have a never-ending opportunity to praise God. You know why? The gospel. The good news of Jesus. John 3.16 For God so loved the world. Who's the world? Us. Pop quiz. All right, Always got to be ready. For God so loved the world that He, what? Gave freely. How many of you love gifts? How many of you love free gifts? Isn't that, isn't that a gift? 
Just roll with it, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Philippians 2, Paul talks to the church at Philippi about how Jesus stepped out of heaven and put skin on, humbled himself. Why? Because there was a need. There was a need. The whole Old Testament, blessings for obedience, cursings for disobedience, search for a sacrifice, sacrifice worthy enough to pay the debt, to pay the debt that, that, that mankind could not pay and they couldn't find it. Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is born comes to earth to pay the debt. So for God so loved the world that he gave. So therefore, Christian, listen to me. We have a never ending. If you are a lover of Jesus, a child of God, a never ending. Everybody say never ending. I just want to make sure you get this. A never ending opportunity to praise and worship the God of the universe, the creator of the universe. Never ending. No matter what, period. Period. No matter what, a never-ending opportunity to praise because he's continuous, he's constant, he never changes. The second thing that David's acknowledging, not only is he continuous, he's contagious. Yes, all of these are going to start with C. You are welcome. I work hard on this stuff. Y'all think I just work on Sundays. I work hard on this stuff. He is contagious. My soul makes its boast in the Lord, verse 2. Let the humble hear and be glad. Let, 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 it, let it overflow it, it, it is, the, is the picture and the word that I love to use. Let the humble overflow. Let them hear and be glad. Because when, he, when we praise, it's contagious. When you, when, you, when you walk, you know why we put Lois at the front door? It's obvious. Because when you walk in and see the joy of Lois, you can't have a bad experience here. It's impossible. And for those of you that don't know Lois yet, growth mindset, she's the one that handed you your bulletin when you walked in the door this morning. It's, it's near impossible. Come on now. To be around the joy of someone like Lois and have a bad day. Right? Because her joy is not because she's without affliction. Her joy is not because she loves rain. Her joy is not based on anything earthly. It is apparent, it is so apparent. That her joy is found in Him. And that's contagious. That's contagious. That's contagious. The third thing David points out is not only is he continuous, not only is he contagious. Praise has the opportunity to raise moods, change hearts, lift souls. And in fact, he is the very definition of praise. But thirdly, he's communal. David says of God, magnify the Lord with me. Praise the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Right? Because community, community is how God works. I mean, I mean think back to creation in Genesis. Right? We, we, we say this often. That the one thing God created, God created the heavens and the earth, it was good. God created the animals, it was good. Which I've got some questions because about some animals. Cats, spiders, snakes. Good? We might be towing a line there. Cat mom. Bless your heart. Right? He makes all of these things and says they're good. And then... And then, and, then, and then we see he created Adam, saw that he was alone, and it's the first time we see this in Scripture. Early on, it's not good for a man to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. Now, 
we like to take that we like to take that and make it into a sappy marriage illustration, right? But, but in the in the core of manhood, God did not create us to be alone. God did not create us to be alone. I.e., when Jesus ascends into heaven, what is the first thing that's created in Acts chapter 2? The church. The body of Christ. And they devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers, to the apostles' teaching. I got that out of order, but you get the point. That the early church devoted themselves to those four things. Why? Why? Because this is not meant to be alone. Why? Because God is a communal God. Yes, he works with us individually. Like the things that people are going to hear, it it always blows me away when people come up to me after the service, Pastor Travis, thank you for saying this. I said that? Yes, you said that. And it's not that I said that, but it's what you heard. Why? Because as we're, as we're doing this thing, the Holy Spirit is going to each and every one of you individually and giving you exactly what you need to apply in your life, in your situation, because God is a personal God, but He works in community. You see that? And David is acknowledging it and praising Him for it, and then, and then he testifies. All right, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fly through this part. He sought the Lord, and He answered me. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. And he, del- he delivered me from all of His fears. That's the first test of, uh, testimony right there, that God delivered him. See, David understood that his prayer was answered when he cried out to God. David understands that when, we, when he cries out to God, when he prays, that God hears him and will respond. Listen to me, listen to me. When you pray, pray with confidence. Pray with the confidence that God is going to hear you and respond to your prayer. Don't pray with with question marks. Pray with confidence. I mean, when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, He said, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, that we might forgive those who trespass. Pray with confidence that God is going to hear and respond. The second thing he testifies about, verse 5, those who look to him are radiant, their faces shall never be ashamed. God not only delivered him, but he delighted him. Just meeting with God brings hope. Why? Because God's hope. God is hope. Verses 6 and 7. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivered him. God not only delivered him, delighted him, but he defended him. Out of my troubles, this poor man is David. He was rescued by the angel of of the Lord, God provided the rescue and gave David the opportunity to testify. And so here's the application here before we move to point two. If we would all spend more time expressing gratitude, mm, wouldn't that be awesome? If we would all spend a little more time expressing gratitude, less for complaining. Right? However, If we were to do that, it means surrendering our control to Him, doesn't it? It means surrendering our preferences and our opinions to Him, to place them in His hands. But it's there where we find our joy. It's there where we find our joy. When we see how powerful God is. And so David acknowledges and testifies about God in the first part of the psalm. And then point two. David provides wisdom for us. In the rest of the psalm, he's speaking to those who would follow him, those who would listen, and trying to impart wisdom, giving some instruction that even we can apply today. He says in verse 8, 
Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste the Lord. Taste the Lord. I mean, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. I'm your provision. I'm your provision. When he's talking to the woman of the well, he's saying, he's saying, I provide water that when people drink, they'll never thirst again. Taste and see that the Lord is good. David's calling out to people to experience what God can do for you. Experience what God can do for you. Number two, fear the Lord. In verse 9, he says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. Fear the Lord. Live with a reverence toward him. Solomon says in, in Proverbs, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear the Lord. Live with a reverence toward him. Verse 10. Uh, the, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Lack no good thing. In verse 10, he's saying, come to the Lord. Flee the desires, flee the desires of what you want for your gain, right? Flee those desires and, 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 and come to the Lord. Verses 11 through 14, I'll summarize them really quickly. Come to the Lord. Come, O children, listen to me. Follow me as I follow God. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. What's he saying here? Turn from evil. Turn from evil. Decide not to take partake in things of wickedness. Turn from evil. Have you ever been wrongly accused of something? Oh man, isn't that, isn't that so frustrating? Isn't that so frustrating? Uh, um, I forget where it is, but flee, the appear, flee of, even the appearance of evil. Flee even the appearance of evil. He's saying, turn from evil. And then verse 14 Turn, turn away from evil. And what does he say there? And do good. Just do good. Do good. He says do good. Be intentional in how you live your life. Accomplish things. Be intentional with how you live life. Many of us aren't meeting marks because we have no marks. We're just waking up and going through the motions day after day after day. We have no goals of intentionality. That, 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 that next year I want to be this. Next year I want to have this type of relationship with my spouse. Next year I want to have this level of communication with my kid. Next year I want to, next year I want to, you know, and we make these quote unquote resolutions, but we have no plan for a actually accomplishing them. So we're not, we're, we're not living with intentionality or purpose whatsoever. And David's, David's saying, do good, be intentional with how you're living your life. Don't just walk through the motions. Be intentional with how you're living your life. That may mean slowing the pace down. Being intentional with how you live your life. And it's important because here's the, here's the reality. As you look at that list, all of those cost nothing to do. You're, you're, not, scrolling, you're not scrolling through your apps and seeing an eight-week plan to tasting the Lord. I would probably click on that just out of sheer curiosity for what that would even look like. An eight-week Not funny? Okay. Right? You don't, you don't see that. They cost nothing except what? Purpose. Intentionality. Time. To set your priority and say, no, you know what? The things of God are going to come first. The things of God are going to come first. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean you ignore the rest, but it means how do, I, how do I live as a child of God in every aspect of my life? How do I live as a child of God in every aspect of my life? To taste that He's good, to do good, to fear, to, to, to turn away from evil. All of these things. And that's what David is calling these people to. 
Because why would, because of who he is and what he can offer us is the motivation for living a righteous life for him. Now, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. David finishes going back to the person and work of God. Because what David's saying here is he sees us. No matter where you're at, what you're walking through today, God sees you. God sees you. And even though it may not feel like He is present in your situation, because you, because you might say, well, if God saw what was going on in my life, maybe He, he wouldn't allow this to happen. Even in the hard things, even in, in the afflictions, God is working something for your good. God is working something for your good. Because here's, here's the truth of the matter. God never wastes an experience. God never wastes an experience. Not only that, but we see His ears toward their cry. Not only does He see us, He hears us. When we cry out to Him, He hears us and He comforts us. Verses 17, when, he deliver, when, he, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. He, he rescues. He judges. He fights for us. Verse 21, affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. And then lastly, verse 22, the Lord redeems the life of His servants. He places us in a place of restoration. He redeems us. He redeems us. There's a lot there, isn't there? There's a lot there. But this is exactly what God did for the Israelites in Deuteronomy 7, verses 8. It says, it says, But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath He swore to your ancestors that He brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of of Pharaoh, King Egypt. Deuteronomy 15, 15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. So here's the big idea this morning. God calls us to Him. Always. God calls us to Him. Always. What we choose to do with this reality, what we choose to do with this information of David acknowledging and testifying about God and, and, and calling on people to follow him as he pursues God, what we do with that is entirely up to each and every one of us individually. That's, that's up to each and every one of us individually. Will we desire to run to him or be slaves to ourselves and our own desires? Are we going to be like the young lion who's trying to cut corners and get more and ignore all of the experience of those who ran before him? Will we desire to run to him or be slaves to ourselves and our own desires? See, this psalm, Psalm 34, expresses gratitude to God. Simply, all of God. All of God. Like, I don't... I'm sitting here listening to the rain just beat down, and I'm sitting to myself thinking, God, why? <laughs> Our wells have to be full... We're not in drought whatsoever. Our summer is short enough. What are you trying to accomplish here? He might be just trying to make me slow down. So you might all be suffering as a result of me just needing to slow down. Because I'm going to go home this afternoon. I'm going to take these jeans off. I'm going to put some comfy clothes on. And I'm going to watch the coverage from the Scottish Open because Rory McIlroy just won. Spoiler, spoiler alert. This morning. He teed off at 3.57 a.m. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, sidebar. 
But the point is this. As it starts raining harder. (laughs) Because I believe that this is in the character of who God is. If you care about it, He cares about it. And if you will turn to Him about it, He will show you why He's bringing you through it. And even as I say that, I know people are sitting here this morning and they're not sure their job is secure. There are people sitting here this morning and their family are wrestling medical decisions and struggles. There are people sitting here this morning financially that are just hurting. There are people sitting here this morning and your marriage is on the line. And so on and so forth. And so even as I say that, I'm conflicted in here because it's like I want to talk to each and every one of you, but let me just say this. God is in it. God is in it. And if you and I will lean on Him, even though it might be different than what our desired outcome will be, He will get the glory and He'll make it good. He'll get the glory and He'll make it good. God got the glory in David's situation of hiding. God delivered him. That's why we get to see this psalm of gratitude, something we can all do more of. But the choice is yours. What will you do with the struggle? What will you do with the affliction? Will you let it get the best of you and steal your joy, or will you lean on God? Will you lean on God? Will you lean on God? That's my fault. I should have ended five minutes ago. (laughs) That's my fault. Worship team's going to come. Here's my prayer for you today. Peace in uncertain times. Peace in uncertain times. Grace in chaos. Mercy in trouble. Peace in uncertain times. If you're walking in an uncertain time today, I'm praying for peace for you. If you you sit and you look at your life and say, it's just chaos. Things are chaotic. This relationship is chaotic. I'm praying for grace for you. And if you're sitting and saying, man, I'm just, this is trouble. I'm praying for mercy. Mercy. So as I pray this morning, I just want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. We're going to close in prayer. And if, you, if you're sitting here today and you say, I need peace, I need grace, I need mercy, would you just cup your hands right out in front of you? I just want to pray for you. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to do anything. I just want you to receive this prayer. So just open your hands right in front of you like you're receiving this gift. God, I pray for each and every person in this room. That you would meet them right where they are today. Hear their cry. Hear their heart. Hear their desire. And then God, give them what they need. God, whether it be grace and chaos, peace in uncertain time, mercy in trouble, whatever, wherever they may be sitting this morning. God, I pray that you would be God in every life, in every situation represented in this room. And God, that, that in doing so, you would help us 
to walk out of this room today with the confidence of David, with the assurance of David, that God, you are in control, that you are still God, and that you're going to deliver, that you're going to delight, that you are going to care for, that you are going to hear the cries of your people and respond in your timing, not ours, so give us patience, but that, God, we would walk out of here with the confidence that you are indeed who you say you are and you're in control. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.